ready? I just gotta wait till you start it, and then I'll go online. As soon as I get the not notification. We'll be live streaming in a few minutes. Hang out and wait. Can you hear that? Yep. Okay. You could. It's called scraping. You scrape the data. All right. I'm going to start a few minutes early because we have an announcement here about, about the thing on the screen over here. Um, hi everyone. I'm Nathan Milo. I'm the president of ACM. Um, we're a local. We're a club on campus. Uh, we deal with a lot of the computers, and computer science um, stuff. So we're kind of a professional development club, and we're sponsoring a programming competition with Lucid Software, a local company. Um, there's a thousand dollars of prizes, free breakfast and lunch, and T-shirts. Um, the sign up is golucid.com slash competition. Uh, you can sign up as an individual or as teams of three. Um, it's way fun. If you're like, you know, not super confident, not everyone is competing to be super competitive, um, but it's a great way to practice your programming skills, have a good time, meet some people in the industry, and get some free food and shirts, and uh, it's a, a fun event. So please sign up, we'd love to have you all, and uh, if you have any questions, you can email me at uofuacm at gmail.com or all the information is on that link. Is that link right? Is it dot com or dot com? Dot co, yeah. Okay. Are there any any questions I can answer? Okay, great. Well, we'd love to have you all there. Thanks so much. Okay. Okay, uh, let us start. Uh, first thing I want to, I got a question for you. Uh, I sent out an email at the last minute trying to set up a homework review session with Stefan, but no one showed up because I only gave you two hours notice. Oh. <laughs> so we want to do this weekly. Uh, the question is, would you rather have it on Monday morning at 11.50 or on Tuesday afternoon at 3? So who prefers the Monday time? And who prefers the Tuesday time? All right. It's, can't do it every time, so we'll do it Tuesday. Uh, I think we reserve the room from 3 to 5. I, that'll conflict with some of the lab sections, but if you want to come to, um, to this, just go to a different section. And that, that'll work out. So we'll do it tomorrow, except we don't know what room it's in. I think it's going to be in room Web L103 tomorrow only, then we'll move it to a permanent place. I'll send out mail this evening. So if you plan to go to Web L103 tomorrow at 3. Talk about what you're going to do. Talk, I'm going to talk. He's going to talk about PS7 tomorrow, the one that was just due. Okay. So you've got a, a new assignment out, PS8, and it's due Thursday. Uh, it involves more, uh, so, similar to the last assignment, in that it involves implementing classes. <coughs> Are there any questions or problems about anything before we proceed? Yes. Okay, so she's asking about the one of the one of the things you're doing in the assignment is you're taking the big the, the rat class that we implemented that uses longs to represent the numerator and the denominator, and you're turning it into a big rat class which uses uh, big integer objects to represent the numerator and the denominator so that you never have any overflow. And your question specifically was why? I didn't quite understand. Um, are we supposed to like, treat it? Is it going to be like a hybrid of the rat class and the big rat, or is it going to be like a strictly only big rat? OK. And she's asking, is it a hybrid of big rat and rat, or is it strictly big rat? Uh, the, the answer, let me just bring the class up. Which 
which is in, it's right here. So this is the class that you are changing. And what you'll do to it is you'll change the name from rat to big rat. Okay? You will change that long and that long so that they are big integers, not longs. This constructor remains, the implementation will need to change. Why can't this implementation stay the same? Because it doesn't, it doesn't use big integer objects. Right. It's here, you can't store zero into a variable that's declared to hold a big integer. So you need to change these. This will need to be the big integer that represents zero, and this will be the big integer that represents one. Same thing here. There'll still be a constructor that takes a long, but you can't be storing that long in the numerator. It wants it the big integer that represents n. And this one, too. It'll still take two longs, but you've got to turn them into big integers. And then you're adding a constructor that takes two big integers as, as parameters. So you have to change all the implementations, because the implementations right now are assuming longs are being used, and you've got to change them to use big integers. Did that get your question? Now, I know students in the past, you look at the class and you'll find a method in the big integer class called, I think it's called too long. It takes a big integer and returns an equivalent long. And people latch on that and think, oh, this is easy. The problem is that method only works if the big integers are small, small enough to be represented as a 64 bit integer. You get a truly huge big integer and ask for a long that's equivalent, you'll get something back that will be useless. So I wouldn't be using that method. You'll find methods to add, multiply, divide, subtract, compute GCDs, and so on. Test equality. Use those. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah? So the, and the constructor, the parameters should still be long? Yeah. The three constructors, the, the headers do not change. And you add a, but you add a fourth constructor. Just the bodies of the constructor need to change. You do not change the, the types of things they take. So you don't have to change it or you can't change it? You cannot change it. Yeah, do not change the headers of any met existing methods. There's, I think there's one you can take out. Um, the two double method I have you take out. But, um, yeah. Don't change anything else in the headers. Yes? So you were saying we didn't need the GCD method at all? You won't need, the GCD method won't do you any good because it works on longs. There is a GCD method in the big integer class you can use. Okay? Yes? Also, if I remember right, you, you've already written a lot of test cases. We have to change the test cases. The right. test cases should still work. They work either way. Yeah, they should, the existing test cases should still work, but they're not, they're not adequate because they only use small integers. You need to do some tests involving giant big integers. Yeah? I'm a little bit confused. Um, if, if we can't have a big integer coming into the method, then what's the... I don't know how to word what I'm trying to say. Into what method? Into any of the methods that are using longs originally, like what is, wouldn't they only ever be able to accept something that's the size of a long, and therefore not necessarily need to be using big integers? All right, so there's a method add right there. Right, it takes in those are in the new in your class those would say big rat instead of rat. Um, those big rats would contain big integers inside them. Which means you would not be able to do something like this because you, you know you, you don't multiply you don't multiply big rats that way. Up here, yeah, you're taking in two longs, but there's a, there's a, a fourth constructor that takes in two big integers. You can just think of these other constructors as being simpler ways to make a big rat when the numbers are small. When the numerator and denominator are small, you could use those. Any other questions? Well, the first thing I want to do today is talk about, we were talking about implementing this React class last time. And um, 
let's wrap up the discussion. So what we had done is we had talked about uh, these two, the, the representation here, private long numerator and private long denominator. So a pair, every object, every big, every rat object will contain within it a pair of uh, a numerator and denominator. And you can see not just any numerator and denominator. The, 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 uh, the, the description here, the documentation says that num, NUM contains a numerator of the rat and this contains a denominator of the rat, but it goes on to say uh, that the GCD of the absolute value of the numerator and the denominator must always be one. That's something we decided on. We decided we're going to always keep them in lowest terms, and the denominator must be positive. So that's why, uh, that, that's key documentation that needs to go on the, uh, on each instance variable needs to explain what it's for and what restrictions there are on it. Uh, looking at what was handed in for PS7, uh, that was left off and a number of students just didn't put comments there at all. That's the most important comment you can add in a class, is explaining what the instance variables are for, how they're used. You know, which, you, know you could guess that NUM is a numerator, but suppose this was X and Y. <coughs> you would really like to know that X is the numerator and Y is the denominator. Okay. So we decided on a representation strategy. That, that's, that's the uh, creative and often the hard part in implementing a class, deciding how to represent the, uh, the, the, each object. Then we could create a constructor. So to have the rational number zero, in lowest terms, the numerator should be zero, the denominator, denominator should be one. So that's what the constructor does. It's, it just initializes the numerator and denominator. Here, uh, if, that, if, uh, if we've got a long n, we do that. The numerator becomes n and the denominator becomes 1. And I just realized standing here that this is incorrect. This implementation of the constructor is not correct. I apologize for that. So where's the bug? Looks pretty simple. How could that possibly be wrong? Yeah? Because num is stored as a long instead of long? No. Num is declared as a long. That's not the problem. Mm -hmm. What's wrong? Yeah. Somebody else want to take a shot? Yeah? Do you have like a magic number? No. I mean, you could argue. Uh, that's, uh, he said, do I have a magic number? The one is sitting there. I think it's obvious enough what the one is for. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure exactly how to clear that up, but that's not the problem. What could be wrong with storing n as a numerator and one as a denominator? Yeah? Divide by zero. Well, he said divide by zero, but there's no division going on. Yeah? If num is equal to zero, then we apply a method called the rat class. We could have zero as the numerator. Well, you're right. If, if, if n is zero, we're going to get zero over one, which is exactly what we got up here. And if you try to divide by that rational number, the division has to throw an exception. But that's not the problem. That's how you. That's not. That's not the problem. Yeah. Is that you can only create integers and not rational numbers? You can only. Uh, he said it's because you only create integers and not rational numbers. Or, no, that's not it. Yeah. Is there some n where you don't have a GCD of one? No. no. The GCD of anything in one is that anything. Yeah. It's not a type conversion thing. You're right that this is an int, and we're storing it into a long variable, but Java will convert that for free. You can turn an int into a long. Okay? Well, look at the, de look at the uh, description of the instance variables. Okay. When, when it describes restrictions, such as the GCD of the numerator and denominator is always one, 
That's not something that is going to happen for free. It's something you've got to make sure is true every time you set the numerator and denominator. So what's wrong? Yeah? Not taking the absolute value of num? Well, this just says that the GCD of the absolute value of num and denominator must always be 1. It doesn't say you have to take an absolute value. It just says that when you do and take the GCD, you'll get 1. And that's certainly true. We're not violating that restriction. Yeah? Are you not checking if the GCD of num and den is always 1? Well, yes, look here. He said we're not checking the GCD is always 1. Well, if I get n, whatever n is, doesn't matter what n is, if I take its absolute value and compute the GCD of that and 1, that GCD will be 1. It's just a mathematical fact. I'm going to have to do any division to put things in lowest terms. Okay? Well, look at both of the comments. Now, I just realized I'm wrong about, the being, about it being wrong. <laughs> I, we had a nice discussion, though. I was, uh, <laughs> I was ready to say I wasn't doing the right thing when n was negative. But I don't have to do anything that is negative. The denominator is the thing that has to be positive. So. Anyway, that's something you have to focus on. You've got to make sure your constructors don't violate the restrictions you've expressed up above. And that's why right here, when we, when we, when we create the, the rat from an arbitrary n and an arbitrary d, first of all, if the denominator is negative, we've got to flip the signs. We've got to negate the denominator and negate the numerator so that it's the denominator that stays positive. And then, then we have to put it in the lowest terms. And then we've got to give values for numerator and denominator. So there's a lot of work to be done in this method right here, in this constructor. Make sure that the denominator is positive and that the, uh, everything's reduced to lowest terms. We did the add method, so let's look at a different one. Oh, we did the multiplication method, so let's look at the add method. Um, so here's the rule for addition, just that you learn when you learn how to multiply fractions. So adding the fraction A over B to the fraction C over D is... You know, you've got to cross multiply. You multiply one numerator by the denominator of the other, do the same for the other pair, add them up, and divide by the product of the denominator. So that's what I do here. I take the numerator of this, the object in which the method was evoked, I take the denominator of R, this parameter right here, multiply them together, that gives me something. Then I multiply the other denominator by the other numerator, add them together, and that's N. D is just the product of the denominators. Now, why do I say, well, and then I, I've got to create a new rat to return. I don't change either existing rat. And so I just return a new rat whose numerator is n and whose denominator is d. That's not quite said right. I return a rat that's equivalent to the fraction n over d. Where do, where do things get put to lowest terms? Because uh, this method isn't dealing with the problem. Suppose I multiply 1 half by 2. And I'm going to get an answer of 2 over 2, something like that. Oh, if I add 1 half plus 1 half, I'm not having a good day. If I add 1 half to 1 half, I should get 1 over 1 is my answer. I'm probably going to get something like 2 over 2. Where does it get put to lowest terms? Yeah. Uh, so when you call lines, uh, when you execute line 73, you're calling the constructor. Right. That you tell the constructor, create the fraction 2 over 2, and it's going to put it to lowest terms. It's the only way to create a... We can only create, when we create something, it's guaranteed to be in lowest terms because our constructors take care of that. And um, none of the other methods ever creates a, a does, never changes the numerator and the denominator. So that's add. Subtract is basically the same, except there's a subtraction instead of an addition in one step. Division is the same as multiplication, sort of, except we've got to check the numerator. The, um, yeah, we've got to make sure that, that that R is not zero. The numerator is zero. That's a problem. This method compared to, it's got to tell me whether this is less than, equal to, or greater than R. Uh, just involves a little cross multiplication. So we 
<coughs> we do this numerator by denominator minus denominator times numerator. And if our answer is less than zero, we return negative one. If our answer is greater than zero, we return one. Otherwise, we return zero. So we're just comparing which is larger that way. You know, we just, you know, uh, one third is less than one half because if you cross multiply, you get two is less than three. The two string method we looked at, uh, the two double just casts the denominator to a double and does a division, and GCD we looked at. So that's, that's that class. Each method's pretty simple. As long as you have in mind, as long as you understand fractions, as long as you understand how to add, multiply, divide, compare fractions. If you don't understand fractions, you're going to have a really hard time implementing a rational number class. You've got to understand what it is you're representing. Okay. So given that you're going to be changing this to use big integers, any questions you'd like to ask to make that job easier? Yeah? Can you just, uh, go down to the compare method again? Say again? I used, to, I used to, uh, the compare method. I wasn't just Okay. Saying. So the compare method, let me get this comment so you can see it. His job, it gets two, it gets two rational numbers. And suppose you do uh, x dot compare to y. If x is less than y, it's supposed to return negative 1. If x is greater than y, it returns 1, or actually any positive number. And if they're equal, it returns 0. Oh, I see. And what it does, you can see right here, to decide if a over d, how it compares to c over d, it turns out you just compare a, a times d and b times c. And that'll tell you. Yep? I was just wondering, for my own curiosity, could you just return one one point zero? Yeah. Return 122? Where does the 122 come from? I don't follow. No, line 122. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so here's the thing. Once you do that, diff is going to be negative if this is less than r. It's going to be 0 if they're equal. It's going to be positive otherwise. Why not just return this instead of going to this if? That would work except that this difference may be along. This difference is along. And we got to return it yet. So that's that's why I didn't return. It. <coughs> yeah. Does the long sum or compare to method? So we could try a return and did not compare. Ah, that's true. There, I think there is a static method in the long class called long dot compare to. So we could we could pass. Uh, we could do something like this. Is what they're suggesting. Mm. Long out compare, it's called. And we would pass in this. And this. And that would do the comparison for us. There's a built-in method that will, you can see what it says. Basically, the specification is the same as uh, as compared to this. So, yes, this would do the right thing for us. But I'll. Well, what the heck? Certainly simpler. And that suggests an implementation using Big Engineers, because I imagine Big Engineer has a compare method as well. Any other questions? Yeah. So. Uh, there's two different constructors, at least with the big rack class. So you have one that takes long instead of the parameter, one that takes big ints. Do you have the one that's long just for convenience of? Yeah. The, yeah. the reason there's those, you, those three constructors remain even in the big integer class is for convenience. You want to create the fraction one half, you don't have to first create a big integer that represents one and so on. Yeah. So wait, there's a, I don't know if I'm using the right terms here, but there's a constructor in the big integer class that constructs a big integer dot zero. Mm -hmm. Is that the same as creating a new big integer and then having zero in quotations? Yeah. So there's a, there's a, constru the, 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 there's a constructor in the big integer class that takes in a string, which is just a string of digits, and creates a big integer from it. Uh, there, are two, there are two constants defined in the class, zero and one. 
so that you, you can just use those directly instead of having to go the long way around. Again, that's just for convenience. I want to change something about the class. First, let's make sure I haven't broken it. So fortunately, I have a test, some tests here, and I run them. Okay, and so the compare to adventure didn't change anything. Um, I'm going to show you something. One only new feature of Java I'm going to talk about today. You're used to using helper methods. You can also call constructors from other constructors. So this thing is, takes no parameters, and it creates the, uh, the rat whose numerator is 0 and denominator is 1. We, uh, you can do this instead. So that looks like, that's a very strange thing, Look, a very strange looking thing. What that says is, call the one argument constructor and let it do the constructing for us. Okay? So what's going to happen when this constructor is called and it calls this of zero? Yeah? It's going to call that constructor and let it do its thing. Okay? Now, you can, if you want to, you could say this of zero, and then you could put more code down here if you need to do something else, something special. The only rule is the call, the call to the uh, helper constructor has to be the first line in, the, in, you, in this constructor. It has to be the first thing you do. Now, how can, we, how can we take advantage of a helper constructor here? Instead of setting numerator and denominator directly, what could we do? How could we invoke this constructor down here? Yeah? This is 0, 1. No, not this 0, 1. Okay. What parameters do we want to pass to this constructor? This and n. Right, this of n, 1. Oh. Now, in this case, there's not any great argument for, um, for doing this because none of these constructors had any code in common. But imagine if all three of these constructors had to worry about putting things in the lowest terms. Then it would be nice just to do it once in the most general constructor and call that constructor from the other places. Just, you, know, you don't have to do this, uh, but you'll certainly see it in implementation, so it's good to know what's going on. That just says that when this constructor is called, the first thing it does is call this constructor. Yeah? What is the relevance of the number, like zero? Why is zero called technically the second constructor? Well, we've got to pass a parameter. We've got to tell it what rational number to create. The job of this constructor is to create the rational number zero. Uh, so it's only because that's the only one that has one parameter. Right. Okay. Well, we could have done this. Instead of calling the one argument constructor, we could have directly called this one and told it to create zero over one. But this is like less efficient to do it that way. Yeah? So if you have uh, multiple constructors that have different names but take the same parameters, can you still use the um, helper constructor? M multiple constructors can't take the same parameters because they have to have the same name. So the flaw in your question was, you have different constructors with different names. Constructors are named after the class. Right? So that wouldn't work. In this case, the constructor has to be read. Now, when you go to change your class from rat to big rat, don't go up here and type, you know, type a big in front of rat, and then go type a big in front of that rat, and a big in front of that rat. Remember this, select it, right click, refactor, rename, and then do big rat return. And it'll change it everywhere. It'll change the test cases, it'll change everything that uses this class. It'll even change the name of the file. You highlight the name you want to change, you right click on it, and you go to refactor. And one of the choices is rename. Talk about something different. Okay, 
so in genealogy, this is called a pedigree. So it shows Ben's pedigree. So uh, basically it shows Ben's ancestors, you know, as, far as, as far as they're known, or as far as they're described here. So um, you got Ben up there. That's his name. He's born in 1956, and then he has his father and a mother. So he, he's got his father's pedigree on the left, and he's got his mother's pedigree on the right. All right, so the father is Sam, born in 1927. You've got Sam's pedigrees, father's and mother's pedigrees. Over there, you've got Jane's father's, uh, Jane's parents' pedigrees. And then there gets to be a point where maybe you just don't know who the parents were, and that's what those slashes are for. Now, suppose we wanted to be able to represent someone's pedigree as an object in Java. I want you to think about how to do it. What information would you need to keep track of inside a pedigree object? Yeah? The name, the year they were born, and the father and mother. Okay, and the father and mother what? Their name, their... Is their sex? Or you'll need their names further on in the pedigree. Okay, so clearly, a pedigree, if we want to represent Ben's pedigree, we've got to store his name somewhere. So you can imagine an instance variable that holds the name. You can imagine an instant variable that, con that contains his year of birth. There, there should be an instance variable for the father and one for the mother. What type of variable should that be? Pedigree. Yeah? Uh, another pedigree object. Another pedigree object. Right, so we need, an, we need four instance variables to contain the four pieces of information up there. Name, year, birth year, father's pedigree, mother's pedigree. So a pedigree object contains two other pedigree objects. Or more precisely, a pedigree object contains references to two other pedigree objects. They don't physically contain them. They just contain references uh, that are suggested by those arrows. What about the case, let's say, with James down here, where there is no pedigree for either the father or the mother? What should we store in the instance variables in those cases? When we don't have a pedigree object. Yeah. We could store an empty pedigree object if there were such a thing. I took a simpler approach. Yeah? No. Yeah, you could store null. Null means I don't know. So, let's go look at... this in action. Let me find the... So we're moving to a different... Example here, I want to see pedigree.job. Alright, so there's my pedigree class. So I have a class called pedigree, and it has instance variables. So, uh, name is a string, year is an int, father and mother are pedigree objects. <coughs> Possibly null. Okay? And here, Well, actually, let me show you. Here's a, the here's a constructor right here. So we've got the constructor that takes in a name, a year, a father pedigree, and a mother pedigree, and stores them all in a, creates a pedigree object to contain them. So it just initializes the four instance variables. So that's the simplest kind of constructor. It just takes in four parameters and stores them in instance variables. And then we have a method, a getter, that will get the name out of a pedigree, one that will get the birth year out, one that will get the father pedigree out, and one that will get the mother pedigree out. So a very simple class. The only thing at all interesting about it is something we've never seen before, is pedigree objects contain other pedigree objects. But that's okay. It's no stranger. You know, if you can contain a string and an int, it would be kind of a weird restriction that you couldn't contain a pedigree. So. That makes sense. How would you create Ben's pedigree now? What code would it take to create Ben's pedigree? Yeah? You just have to um, input all the information and then we'll make the... <coughs> okay. So you would have to first create the pedigree object for Ben's father. And then you need to create the pedigree object for Ben's mother. Then you could create Ben's pedigree. So I've got a, a little bit of code here, pedigree demo that shows that. This, this method right here, make pedigree, 
creates Ben's pedigree, just like that picture we had. So you notice the first thing it does is it creates a pedigree for James. And we know James was born in 1850, but we don't know mother and father, so we pass null in. So that'll create a pedigree object whose mother and father are null. Then we create Larry. Uh, Larry's father is James, mother is unknown, so we store null. And we just work our way down. We create Chris, Wayne, Maud, Sam, Jane, Ben. So we're going from the older generations to the newer generations. In the end, we've got enough information to create Ben's pedigree. Okay? And if you want to visualize Ben's pedigree, how should you do it? Yeah? Tree like you had yeah, this little tree like I had. That's how you visualize it. So we created, well, we created James first, and then we created Larry, and then we created Chris. I'm not sure exactly what order I did it in. At that point, I could have created Sam, and then I had to come create Wayne, Maud, Jane, and finally Ben. So this is how we're going to be visualizing it. So let me stop here before we do anything with this object. See if there are any questions about how to think about this object or how it was constructed. Yeah. Can you go back to the pedigree object? Uh, how, so when you can store things as a null, is that just a, uh, an attribute because for strings, or is that? No. Um, there was a question in the midterm, and it said something like, "What is a value? Give me a value you can store in any reference variable of a reference type, and it's null." Any variable that would hold any kind of object other than a primitive, any kind of reference type, you can store null in its place. So you can store null in a string variable, or you can store it in a pedigree variable. Okay. okay. Other question, yeah? Sorry, I don't understand um, why you create the object from downside to the upside. Uh, was mm -hmm. that? Well, yeah. I cannot create, the question is, why did I create them in this order? Yeah. I cannot create Ben's pedigree until I have Sam's pedigree and Jane's pedigree, does it? Oh. Right? And I create, can't create Sam's pedigree until I have Larry and Chris. So that, those constraints force me to do it in that order. Yeah? So, I feel like it would be easy, like, you could do it in that order by just working your way to the bottom and top and make it a lot more. <clears throat> Simpler, so you can start with, I need this person, and this person, and you show up. Well, if I started, if I created Ben's pedigree first, what would I pass as this parameter, and what would I pass as that parameter? Well, if you, just for like organizational purposes, if you start at the bottom and then on top, instead of going coming down and going up from that, it would allow you to keep organized on what you need to create without forgetting. So, for instance, if you need Sam and Jane, then you create their pedigrees, and then you from there you go up and you create um, the, the parameters inside those, and it allows you to not forget. All right, so you're thinking, and in fact, when I wrote this, I may have written this line first and worked backwards. Right, just Sure, to so maybe it helps to read it backwards, but it runs, it's got to run in this, in the other order, mm -hmm. so that things are created before they're needed. <clears throat> yeah? Can you store wrapper classes? Say again? Can you store wrapper classes? Uh, yeah, you can pass null to a cons yeah. Well, no, a wrapper class like integer expects an int as a parameter. So you could you couldn't store null, you couldn't pass null to the integer constructor. You could store null in an integer variable though. Okay, so we can create these things and we can visualize them like that. But I'm going to write a method that would take in a pedigree, such as Ben's pedigree, and tell me uh, how many generations there are, or how many people there are. Okay? Let me see which one I did first here. Okay, I want a method that would take in a pedigree and return the number of people in the pedigree. So what should my method return if I pass it Ben's pedigree? What should it say? How many people are in Ben's pedigree? Eight. Right. You see there are eight boxes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right. I want to write a method that does that. How is it going to work? What's it going to do? How, how can we get a pedigree to work? Like get a method to 
sort of consume this thing and tell us how many how many boxes there are, yeah? You check if the mother and father are null, and then go into the, the mother and father's pedigree and check that null. Yeah. We can certainly check if the mother or father is null. Yeah. Does that mean you would need to store all these objects in a list of some sort so it can count the list? No, I don't want to store them in a list. I've got them. I, right? They're in a nice tree. That's the way I like them. I'm not going to put them in a list. Yeah? Okay? Let me tell you another way to think about it. I think there are two kinds of pedigrees. You've got a pedigree that consists of a box with two sub-pedigrees. That's what's at the bottom. So I'm letting a triangle stand for an arbitrarily complicated pedigree. So every pedigree that shows up is either of that form or it's null. Okay? So if we go back to this picture, Okay? If we, what kind of pedigree is this? Is this, is, is, is this bin pedigree of the first kind or the second kind? Second kind, where this is the box. This whole paternal side of bin's pedigree is one triangle. Think of it as because it's a sub-pedigree. And this is a sub-triangle. So your program, it comes a lot easier if you, if you realize that there are only two kinds of pedigrees. Null and what I'll call the other kind. So, how many people are contained in the null pedigree? Zero. One. I've heard zero and I've heard one. One of them is right. Well, you say one. Who's the person stored in the null pedigree? What's his name? The, when was he born? Wouldn't it be the person whose pedigree like called it? Or? No, no. All we know, that's all we know. Oh. Null says, there's not a pedigree there at the end of the line. So what's really the only sensible answer for how many people are represented, how many people are contained in the in an empty pedigree, a null pedigree? Zero. Okay? How many people are contained in a pedigree of this form? How can you say two? This can be this this thing here could go back to Adam and Eve. You don't know how big those triangles are. You just know that the pedigree is of this shape. So how would you count? How would you count the number of people? Yeah? Would you first need to go through the pedigree line of the mother, and then go through the pedigree line of the father? I don't know about going through. He said first you go through the pedigree line of the father and then the mother. There's a simpler way to describe what you have to do. Yeah? Uh, you could find the number of people uh, associated with the mother's pedigree and then the number associated with the father's pedigree and then add them to find the total. Okay. Then. So essentially what he said was you figure out how many people are in this pedigree right here, this first triangle. You find out how many people are in that pedigree. You add them up and add one. That's how many are in the big pedigree. There's really no way, another way to describe the answer since we, I'm not letting you see the detail of what's in the triangle. The best we can say is, compute the size of that, compute the size of that, add them together and add one. That'll get you the number of people in the whole thing. You had a question? Uh, no, I, I just wonder if, if we can set another variable um, with type int, and every time we call an object, we call an object and we add one. And finally, we got uh, how many objects we have called, and so that's the number of people. Well, you're, you're, think, you're describing a different way to think about it, and, and you left something out of your description, which is how, to, how you move through the tree to add one to a variable over and over. I want to take, I want to take the comment, you know, the, 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 the conclusion that I reached, and implement size. So what do we to say? There's two kinds of pedigrees. How can we tell which kind P is? We're supposed to get the size of P. Okay? So how do we know if P is the null kind of pedigree? How can we test that? Yeah? Uh, check if the parent variables are null. No. If P is null, there are not going to be any variables in it at all. It's just null. <clears throat> How can we tell if P is null? Yeah? Uh, if P is not equal to zero? No. Yeah? It doesn't have an ID on the key. Well, 
there's an ID. No, actually, null is not stored on the heap. Null is just null. If it doesn't have an ID associated with that, no. If you looked at it in the Clifty debugger, you just see null. Yeah. Right. You just ask is p null. Okay. Easy enough. Now, what did we say the answer was? How many people are contained in the null pedigree? Zero. So we should return zero there, right? All right. Otherwise, I've got to compute. How do I, the answer I got to do? I got to go to like, say there's p dot get father, right? So that's that's the father's pedigree, and this is the mother's pedigree. And I'm supposed to find out the size of the father pedigree and the size of the pet fa mother pedigree, add those up, and add one. If only there were a method that would tell me the size of that pedigree right there, we would be in business. Can you use the same one? My gosh. That size method right there, it says, <laughs> returns the number of people in P. Holy cow, why don't we just use it? Let's see. So let's return the size of the father's pedigree plus the size of the mother's pedigree plus one. That's what we said we would do, right? Get the size of the father's pedigree, the size of the mother's pedigree, add them together, add one. That's our answer. What's what? We need to complete the size method now. Complete the size method is done. There. I don't see any red. Let's see if it works. What did we decide? It was eight. So here I'm computing the size of n. So if this works, it should print out eight as the size of n, right? Size is eight. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So wait, just for my understanding, and maybe some other people's. So okay. you basically just call the method on itself, and if it's null, then you're going to return zero automatically. No, I don't call the method on itself. I call the method on a, new, on a different pedigree. So the size method takes in a pedigree. Mm -hmm. So if you pass in Ben's, Ben is a pedigree, it's going to call the size method on Ben's father's pedigree and the size method on Ben's mother's pedigree. You'll get two integers back, add them up, <coughs> return one, I mean, add one and return it. Yeah? So is the idea with this method being like for every mother and like father pedigree, it adds one to the count? No, 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 don't think of it that way. Look, it's really important to think about this the right way. Think about what size does on that. If it's null, you, no one would argue with me when I said if the size of the null pedigree is zero, the size of the other kind of pedigree is one plus the size of that triangle plus the size of that triangle. That's all the code is doing. It's just doing what we said. Yeah? So until it reaches the null, it just keeps calling the size on itself? I don't know. You're, you're wondering what would happen if we step through it in the, in the debugger and see what happens. And I'm going to have you do that tomorrow in the lab. But right now, I want you to think a little more abstractly. Don't worry about what's going inside the computer's memory. Just worry, does this make sense? Is that a statement of fact? Is it true that the size of null pedigree is zero? Does everyone agree? Yes. This should do the right thing if you pass it null. OK? What's that number right there? You can't say if it's 7 or 2 or 11. What can you say about that thing I just highlighted? It's going to be the size of the father's pedigree. How do you know that? Because you, let's see. You're passing the father's pedigree, and it says right there, returns the number of people in P. In this case, P stands for P.getFather. Right. That's what it does. The method, we trust our methods to do what they say they'll do. And that says it returns the size of, of this, it says it returns the size of that pedigree. It'll return the size of that pedigree. So it's hard to argue. We take the size of the father's pedigree, the size of the mother's pedigree, add them all together with one, and that's the size of the other pedigree.
You buy it? Am I cheating? Yeah. So when does it stop? Like that? When does it stop? It stops when it has added the, the size of it, it confused the size of the father's pedigree, the size of the mother's pedigree. Well, and can you use it if it doesn't have a reference to another business? Can you use a get father on one that doesn't have a father? If you try to use get father on a, on a null pedigree, that won't work. So when you return to zero? Yeah. Sure. If you, ask, if you ask that. So let's go back to this. People want to know when it will stop. Um, when does the math dot square root method stop? When it's close enough? How does it know it's close enough? My point is, no one's ever asked that question before. You just believe. You believe. Math square root is going to do what it says it will do. That's all I'm asking you to do, is believe size will do what it says it will do. And it will. All you have to do is believe. <laughs> all right. So, you know, I'm playing a game with you here. I'm not conning you. Um, the, the, this code is perfectly fine. The technique is called recursion. Uh, recursion is when a method calls itself. And for some reason, students go haywire when they see recursion. And I think the reason is because most students don't have a very good understanding of what's going on inside the computer in the first place. And it just seems like, like nuts when a method can call itself. Okay. And all I'm telling you here is the way to think about recursion is you convince yourself, convince yourself this is right. When you're looking at this code right here, you just assume that size is going to do what it says it will do. So if you assume this call to size will give the size of the father's pedigree, and this will return the size of the mother's pedigree, and you're adding up returning one, and you convince yourself that's the right thing to return, that's all you have to do. You don't have to worry about where does it stop. Yeah? Well, then, how do we know what to write if we just don't know what it does? Say what? Like, how do we know what to write, in a sense, like, if we don't know exactly what it does? You know, like, because we're all used to straight line coding, and this kind well, of... Well, like, but you... Okay, you've all written methods. Okay? Let me write you another... Let me write you a method real quick. Uh, public double F double D, return two times, okay, so we're going to do that, I'm going to put a comment here, I'm going to make it static, and I'm going to say returns twice the square root of D. Does that method work? I'll even, I'll even add requires v is greater than equal to zero. It's not going to work if, if uh, does that method do what it, do what's advertised? Does it return twice the square root of, of d? How many think it does the right thing? Okay. How many of you know how square root works? How can you be so sure it works if you can't tell me how square root works? I've tried it and I know it works. You are, you are depending, what you're depending on is that square root does what it says it will do. You're comfortable doing that. You assume, when you're trying to understand a piece of code you've written, you assume that methods will do what they say they'll do. That's all I'm asking you to do here with, with this recursive method. Just assume that the calls, the recursive calls, do what the comment says it will do. Yeah? That, um, the, the pedigree size is, I believe, primitive recursive. So well, let's not get, we don't want really to talk about shades of recursion. We could. Talk to me later. Okay. <laughs> yeah? So I get that the, the method, it, it uses the size method to get on the get father, but where does it keep track? They're not using it, it, it's in recursion, but where does it keep track of the eight? For example, we're getting a method, like it's returning eight because there's eight in this pedigree. Well, and there's no keeping track. Example. It computes that and it gets, I think, four. It, 
computes that, it gets 3, and then it adds up 4, 3, and 1, and gets 8, and returns it. It's just a poor little method that's calling a couple helper methods. Yeah? So it's one thing to trust the code that's in the default Java library. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to trust the code that I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> OK, that's very true. But I'm telling you that the way to think about recursion is you, what you have to convince yourself. Just when you convince yourself that that method is correct, the way you do it is you say, OK, that returns a square root, this returns twice a square root, therefore it's correct. All I'm asking you to do is to look at this and say, OK, this returns, returns the size of the father's pedigree, this returns the size of the mother's pedigree, add them up and add one, that's the answer. Yeah, that's the right way to do it. I'm just asking you, if you think that way and your reasoning is correct, your method will be correct. Yeah? Uh, I think maybe a uh, summary like uh, call the method uh, itself as itself helper. Yeah you, can view the, yeah, you can view the method as a helper for itself. Yeah. And as with all helpers, think about what it does in terms of its Java doc. You don't go looking into the square root method to, find, to see what it does. You look at the Java doc right here. You want to know what size does? Look at the Java doc. That's all I'm asking you to do. If you could convince yourself, if, you know, if, if your, your reasoning has to be sound, but if, if it's possible to argue that this is the correct thing to do based only on the Java doc, it will do the right thing. I can remember where I was when I went from not understanding recursion to understanding recursion. It was in, uh, I think it was November of 1975. I was doing a homework assignment and it entailed understanding recursion. And I, it was this problem, I didn't know how to do it. I thought about it a while and suddenly it just came to me, of course how I could solve this very easily using recursion. And so I handed in a solution that was yay long. The people around me were creating solutions that were hugely long and didn't work. And that's when I realized that I was going to major in computer science. Is that a sign? <laughs> okay? So that was an epiphany to me. I, it was just it was such a rush to, to understand this thing I hadn't understood before. So let's take a break and I'll uh, try to give all of you that epiphany. I miss it. Okay, so for those of you dying to see what's going on as a pr program runs, here's what I'm doing. I'm setting a breakpoint on line 58. But I don't want it to break every time it hits line 58. I want it to break when p is equal to null, when, when the method is called with p having a value of null. And so you can, I set a break, you can set a property of a breakpoint, and the property I'm setting is p equals null. So the breakpoint won't work unless p is null. That's a neat little thing you can do. Now, notice our code. It, in fact, let's, I'm going to spell this out here. So let f be the, the size of the father's pedigree. We'll let, uh, I forgot to say size. I'm going to let m be the size of mother's pedigree. And then I'm going to return f plus m plus 1. Now, doing it in steps like that will make it a little bit simpler. Okay. And actually, the first thing I'm going to do here is I'm going to disable the breakpoint. Actually, I didn't think about this enough. I'm going to delete it. It's hard to do this. Okay, let's debug and see what happens. So we're passing in bin. Okay, so we got here to this. So if we look at P, uh, and I expand it out, it's going to contain, okay, year is 1956, Ben is the name, then pedigree number 19 is the mother, pedigree number 18 is the father. 
Okay? Now I'm going to remove this breakpoint because it's going to cause me a distraction. Now, when I hit step over, what's going to happen? Is P null? No. No, so it'll go down to that else. So we'll step over. Now, when I step over that, what's the value of F going to become? Does that make sense? Let's look. I think the size of the father's pedigree was 4, right? So size of p dot get father should return 4. So I'll step over it, and we'll see. F becomes 4. I step over the mother's pedigree. I get 3. And then I add the 4, 3, and the 1, and that's where the 8 comes from. So it just made a call to two helper methods, size and size, got back 4 and 3, added 4, 3, and 1. Okay? The same way we look at regular methods, non-recursive methods. We just step over and see what they're doing. Now, a lot of you are curious, what happened when we called get father? Because a lot of stuff happened when that happened. So what I'm going to do now is I'll end this. And I'm going to go to size now, and I'm going to take that breakpoint. And now I'm going to set it to be uh, conditional. Apply it and close. And then I'm going to run my main method again, and we'll see where it stops. It didn't stop at all. I didn't run it in debug mode. Okay, now I'm going to run it in debug mode. <laughs> Okay, and it stopped. And this is what I want you to look at. There is a stack frame for the main method. Remember, we talked about stack frames before. Every time you call a method, a stack frame is used to store its variables. What variable is in main's stack frame? What do you see up there on the right? At least those of you in the front. Right, args and bin. So it's, right now, it's up this line of code is computing the size of bin. It called size. This stack frame is size's stack frame, and it's on this line right now, trying to compute the size of Ben's pedigree. Well, it made a call. What you see? What it just just it did. So, what will I see when I look at this stack frame? Size called size, and now this is the pedigree for Sam. And it has made a call to size. It's right here to find out the size of Larry's pedigree. And Larry has made a call up to here to find out James' pedigree. And that, P is null. So if you want to know what's happening inside the computer, main calls size, which 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 is about to return zero. And it'll return zero. And so what will happen when I step out of this method? It's being asked to, to, to return the size of null. What is it going to do when I click step out? Will I be back in main? Yeah? I want to go into the size method for, yeah, that. Okay, so this is the method that just called to get the size of James's pedigree. Uh, James' father is null, so it's computing that. When I step out, I'm just back here. Now it knows that f is 0. So it's so right there. Now it's going to compute the size of null. So I think this is more confusing than the way I described it in the first place. Unless you're really solid with the way runtime stacks work and stack frames, this is pretty opaque. So you can think about that if you want to, but I really encourage you to think about the way I've been encouraging you to, just in terms of just assume that helper calls will do what they're supposed to do. Now, you can do more of this in the lab tomorrow, trying to get different ways of thinking about recursion. My favorite way of thinking about recursion is, it's just a method call. It's no different. Maybe we shouldn't give it a special name. It's just, it's just a method call. Think of it like a method call. But any questions I could answer about this? Okay. Notice this is taking space, right? It's memory allocated for four different invocations of size right now. All right. So it turns out, I like patterns, as you know. Every method we're going to write that consumes pedigree is going to look like that. 
there are two cases. Either we're dealing with a null pedigree, in which case we do one thing, or we're dealing with a uh, non-null pedigree, in which case we've got to solve the problem for the mother, solve the problem for the father, and then combine to produce an overall answer. That's always going to be the pattern. We can do the mother and the father in any order. So let's go back to our, to our class here. I'm going to go back to the job of you. Let's do depth. I want to know what's the largest number of generations you can go back. Now, in the case of our pedigree right here, what's the answer going to be? One, two, three, four. Pedigree has a depth of four. Okay? Um, so let's do that here. What will the code look like for depth? What will it be similar to? It's going to have the same structure as size. So let's copy this. That's the structure that was on my slide. All right, now let's make it work. What is the depth of the null pedigree? Zero. Zero. Says so in the comment. Okay? How do we compute the depth? If you know the depth of the father's pedigree, and you know the depth of the mother's pedigree, What is the depth of my pedigree? If I know the, my mother's depth, I know my father's depth. Yeah? Uh, the largest depth between them and then plus one for you. Right. We take the larger of <coughs> my mother's depth and my father's depth. <laughs> so we take the larger of F and M, which we've already computed, add one. And that's the answer. That's all there is to it. We've got my father's depth, my mother's depth, take the max, add one. That's my depth. And so if we run that, we get a depth of four for Ben, which is what we decided. Now let's see what the other one was. I don't know why I printed out depth first. I'm missing something. Oh. Next one is oldest. I just labeled it wrong. Okay. So there's our second uh, recursive method that's consuming a recursively defined. These are the, it's the simplest kind of recursion, the kind that consumes a recursively defined data structure. Yeah. Why wouldn't the, um, the depth method um, return the depth of the following plus the following? Well, if I have a, okay, so if I have a, a you know, if this is my pedigree tree, what's the depth of that tree? One, two, three, four, five, six, six levels in the tree. Okay. It has. It, it just depends on the. I find it's either that's the biggest or that's the biggest. Oh, okay. And then I add one to it, right? And we're counting all the things. Right. I'm counting sort of the maximum number of levels, the maximum number of generations you go back. Oh, okay. Like the two generations. Okay. So it follows that same that same <coughs> pattern. Let's try this. I want to know the oldest birth year in the pedigree tree. So if we go back to my picture, if I pass it Ben as a parameter, what should I get back as the answer? The oldest birth year. 1850. We ought to find that birth, birth year. Yeah? Could you just do an optimization loop and iterate through all the different pedigrees? Uh, no. I mean, there's no, no convenient way to iterate through all the pedigrees because they're not organized into a list. Okay. This, what will the structure of oldest look like? 
I hate to be a broken record, but it's going to be the same as the structure of depth. They're all going to be this structure. It's just, it's just the nature of this is what pedigree trees are like. So, I want to know the oldest person in a pedigree tree, the birth year of the, uh, the oldest birth year in the pedigree tree. And I don't know what to return. It said to return integer.max value. I think that's the wrong thing. I should really have it return zero. Let's just do zero. I want to return a small number for the oldest person. Say <coughs> zero. Better answer. Okay. Well, if they were born before zero. They're born before zero. Well, that's possible. BC. So we'll let BC be. Uh, negative numbers, and then we'll just return the most negative integer. What if they were born before then? Okay. Uh, this is called the base case. The other one's a recursive case. Yeah? Uh, but don't you want to take the minimum value so you return the max value for one that doesn't exist? So if you take, like, you know, the oldest in your father's tree and the mm -hmm. oldest in your mother's tree, but your mother's tree doesn't exist, it returns zero, and you take the minimum of those two years. Ah, okay, so you're, yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's tricky. Let's leave it this way, and we'll, we'll see what, why max value is going to be a better choice after all. I should have trusted myself. Okay, let's, see. let's ignore that for a moment. Uh, how am I going to find out the oldest person in my father's side of the tree? Yeah. Uh, you uh, set in f is equal to oldest of p dot get right. I'll just call I'll just call oldest. If oldest finds, and we'll find out the oldest person in my mother's side. And now, who's the oldest person in the whole thing? What's the oldest birth year in the whole thing? Right. Let's take the, What would that work? Suppose we take the minimum of the oldest year, I mean, older is going to be a smaller year, right? So what if we take the minimum of the oldest person in my father's tree and the oldest person in my mother's tree? Does that sound about right? Okay, this is where the issue comes in. Suppose the oldest person in my father's tree is born in 1800, and there's no one in my mother's tree at all. My mother's tree is null. And when I take the min, what am I going to get back? And I'll get back min value, which is some big negative number. So that's, that's why I was right in the first place. I should say max. And I'll only get max value back if, if there's no information about birthdays at all. Is that right? For any old tree I get, if I compute the oldest person in my father's tree and the oldest person in my mother's tree, take the smaller of those, is that going to be the oldest person in the overall tree? Yeah? I'm a little concerned because our method doesn't ever reference the pedigree we're on. Uh -huh. So we'll never get the birth year of Right. So let me just show you this. Let's go back and look at this picture here. Look at James right there. What answer should we get back when we ask for the oldest birth year in James's pedigree tree? We better get 1850 back. But what will our program return? It, it looks for the men of James's father's oldest and James's mother's oldest. Both of those are going to be max integer. Both of those are null, so they're going to get max integer back, and we're going to get max integer as the answer. So we have to take, when we're computing Ben's pedigree tree, we've got to take Ben's birth year into account. Okay? Same for mall. So, how do we do that here?
Is it called? He dog. Get. Get for Okay, so you've, you've got to take the birth year at the root of the tree into account. So the, the, the oldest birth year in a pedigree is going to be the smallest of the oldest birth year on the father's side, the oldest birth year on the mother's side, and the birth year of the person themselves. So if we run this now, we should get 1850 as the oldest. And we do. Finally, let's do this one right here, names. I want to print out, I want to write my method to print out the names of everyone in the pedigree. Okay? So, we're used to this by now. I've got to copy the pattern and decide what to do. There's nothing to return. I just got to do some printing. So, what should I print if P is null? Are there any names to print? No. Nothing to do if it's null. What if it's not null? What do I print out? How do I print out the names of everyone in the tree here? What can I print out? What's something I can print out? Shoot. Is there some name we know? Yeah? All right, we'll print out P's uh, name, like, let's say, Ben. Then, how do we print out the rest of the names? Yeah? Just do P, dot, father, P, dot, his father, dot, No, well, that's, you know, you got the right idea, but you got the syntax wrong. Yeah? Would it be uh, names? P dot get father. Right. So we print out our name. We print out all the names in the father's pedigree. And then what do we do? We print out all the names in the mother's side of the tree. So that should print out all eight names. And there they are. Now, what determined the order? It looks like it printed out Ben, and then it printed out the father's line, and then the mother's line. Why did it do that? that was, that's what we did right there. We don't want to print them out a different order. We print them out a different order. Maybe that'll do. In fact, let's change it so that it prints out the mother's line, and then it prints out the father's line, and then it prints out our name. Now, it's it's clear that Ben will be printed out last. Who will be printed out first? The last question I'll ask, and then we're out of time. Here's the tree. When we print it that way, who, what will be printed out first? Is it James? Well, no, it would be Ben. Well, it prints out the mothers. Okay, I think it will be Mom. Let's see. If you're able to answer that question, you understand things pretty well. So it printed out Maud first and Ben last. So it calls, it just goes down the mother's line stuff. All right, you'll see a lot more of this tomorrow in lab and, and the Wednesday in lab. You get a zero on your next time. Damn it! I'm sorry. <laughs> Why don't you just walk back here, man? I'll get your butt going across. <laughs>